Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, NYC Waste Free, celebrating the bicentennial of Frederick Douglass's birth, and some live jazz. Welcome to the show. I'm Ashley Ford, and I lied yesterday. I said I wanted a break from Trump, but this is too irresistible. In fact, what I'm about to quote has given rise to a whole new installment on our show. Well, call it Trump-inspired. He spawned a new strand of writing we want to honor. They are these gems, these Susian salads of adjectives, analogies, and metaphors that paint indelible pictures of our dear leader. They are intense with vitriol and vexation over the fact that this man is still somehow and sadly sitting in the Oval Office. Our honoree today is Rick Wilson, writing in the Daily Beast about Trump breaking the seal on labeling people treasonous. That's one of our nation's most serious crimes, remember? As in Democrats who neglected to applaud his State of the Union speech. Wilson, a self-professed conservative, gave this description of DJT. A statist abomination, a plump, bewaddled, authoritarian wannabe, man-baby with the intellectual horsepower of a toaster oven. And I think he means like a sunbeam, not one of those fancy kinds, okay? He's not a smeg, he's not a KitchenAid, sunbeam. In any case, well said, well said. Send us your favorites at 112BK comments at brickartsmedia.org. On the show today, We'll talk to the person who came up with the zero waste guidelines for the city, the great-great-grandson of Frederick Douglass to celebrate the bicentennial of the latter's birth, and jazz vocalist Rome Neal will sing us a song in studio. But first, these things. On Monday, Borough President Eric Adams called on NYCHA to use money they've saved on energy costs to fix broken boilers and heating systems in city housing. Wait. At first glance, this seems a bit odd. They've saved money on energy, but is that because they haven't been providing heat in their houses? Well, they haven't been providing sufficient heat, it turns out, but it doesn't seem as if this was their money-saving tactic. It's because their boilers are busted. The savings came from conversions from oil to natural gas a number of years ago, and they total about $48 million. Adams is saying it's time to reinvest that into providing energy in the form of reliable heat to the tenants. Follow? I follow, I think, finally. You've seen those electrified, heated, white dog houses on street corners? The ones that have you wondering, A, do people really use these for their dogs? And B, do people really use these for their dogs? Well, it's a Brooklyn-based company called Dog Parker. And yes, I guess they get some use, but maybe not anymore on our city streets, after a kerfluffle with the Department of Transportation. The DOT sent out a cease and desist letter to the company, citing obstruction to public property and threatening to levy fines and impound its dog houses. So Dog Parker removed them, saying it might move its entire operation to a place probably like Portland, a city that cares about entrepreneurship and having cozy confines for canines when it's raining which it certainly does in Portland. Brooklyn will soon be home to the highest residential infinity pool in the Western Hemisphere, according to multiple reports. The pool will sit atop a new building pop going up at City Point just a couple of blocks from here and will be perched 680 feet above the street. It features a stargazing observatory, open-air movie screenings, and panoramic views of infinity. Well, actually, infinity will be obstructed by views of Manhattan, but that's not so bad. Fittingly, the project is slated to be completed in 2020, just after the release of the Infinity Wars movies by the Avengers, which is what I'm really into. Anyway, stay tuned for our first guest. What to do with waste? That question has long vexed this city. At one point, we just threw it into the ocean. Then, not to be judgmental or anything, we made Manhattan with it, literally. When Fresh Kills landfill closed, we started shipping our trash to other states, but that's been expensive. Now we're just trying to make it vanish altogether. The mayor has an ambitious goal to send no waste to landfills by 2030. Our next guest thinks this goal can be achieved, at least partially, through design. 
and she authored the city's zero waste guidelines for design. She's architect Claire Mifflin, and we welcome her to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. So New York generates a lot of waste, which doesn't surprise me. I, I mean, I put out my trash once a week. I know what's happening out there, and we're really conservative with our waste. So can you give us a sense of how big that mountain is? Like, when we talk about the waste that New York City produces, what are we talking about? We're talking about 12,500 tons a day in in the waste that the Department of Sanitation picks up. So the Department of Sanitation picks up from residences and some institutions, and they have very good um, data, so they know how much they collect. On the private sector, for all commercial waste, we think it's about the same, but the data's not as good. Okay, hold on just a second. How many tons <laughs> did you say? Twelve and a half thousand. Twelve and a half thousand tons a day. day. So it's like 3.8 million a year. Okay, and that doesn't include the commercial, yeah. except it's you, probably about we the estimate same about the same. Fantastic. Uh, good to know. A little terrifying. Um, so these are some really ambitious goals yes. <laughs> to be not sending waste to landfills by 2030. Um, what are the goals? Can you interpret them for us a little bit as far as um, the specific goals of zero waste? Okay, so that is, you got the goal exactly that's right. The, that's the number one. <laughs> exactly right. Zero waste to landfill by 2030. Mm -hmm. Now, we do send about 20-something percent of our waste to the incinerator. Mm -hmm. I think there's two, the one in, um, in New Jersey, mm -hmm. um, and I think there's another one in Connecticut. So those incinerators will still continue to take waste, mm -hmm. but we still need to drastically reduce the amount of waste we're producing, and Absolutely. then we need to divert a lot of it through recycling, through organics collection, mm -hmm. through reuse. I mean, all that furniture adds up to, and through creating less waste to start with. Yes. How does zero waste, like, how do you define it in terms of, you know, because I know that, like, there's always going to be some waste. Yeah. Like, even that girl who, you know, tried to live waste-free for a year and was able to fit all her waste in one jar by the yeah. end of the year, even she yeah. still had some waste. And that was extreme. Yeah. So, I mean, what does that actually look like? Well, the Zero Waste International Association defines zero waste as getting 90% reduction. So you still mm. have that 10%, but it says you should have a plan for that 10%. But it Fantastic. will certify a community as zero waste community when it's got down to 90% reduction from where it was before. New York City doesn't quite take that exact um, metric for its goal, it's, it's zero waste to landfill they're trying to, right. to do, because a lot of that waste, you said ship, some is ship, but most of it goes by rail or train. Really? I mean, or train or truck. So a lot of it is trucked in these 18 wheelers down to South Carolina, Pennsylvania, yeah. So that level of energy being used, I can't imagine an 18-wheeler hauling, yeah. like, just full just of waste. Track. I mean, it, once you start thinking about it, you're wow. like, do I force my kid to finish their pizza or will I have it hauled by truck down to South Carolina to a landfill? It kind of consumes right. you. <laughs> so what can be done via design to help us reach this zero waste goal? Well, a lot can be done. I was just looking at your um, recycling and waste out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can label it clearly and have visual cues. So whenever mm -hmm. you have waste, like in many offices, you'll have a bin by your desk mm -hmm. and it'll, you'll put everything in there mixed so then it doesn't get separated. Right. But Etsy, for example, that's one of our case studies, they only have um, waste collection at their central pantry. Mm. And they also use feedback loops. So it says right there how much waste they diverted last week. So they have this really well-designed um, waste station. Mm -hmm. They have a, a, a big square opening for compost and different size openings for the recycling streams. It's clearly labeled right there, so you don't have to look on the front, mm -hmm. which is what I was saying you do here. <laughs> you have it clearly labeled on the opening. And then the actual trash stream is just a small circle like that because they've kind of designed their offices so no waste is created. Wow. Like all their snacks are unpackaged, all their, they have coffee and everything on tap. Um, they have to-go cups you can take out to get a discount cappuccino in the neighborhood and then you put it in the dishwasher. Um, if you're not sure where, which waste stream something goes into, they have a Slack channel. Um, and then when the waste is taken, the housekeeper puts it into this hamper and she hits on a tablet what type of waste it is and that gets um, calculated into a diversion 
um, statistics. So right there where you throw your trash away, it says, we diverted 90% last week. What? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. <laughs> and the employee, in, in, um, um, when a new employee comes, they get taught how to throw something away. I love that. Like, I really, really, I know I'm sitting here, you're probably looking at my face like, what? And I'm like, I'm astounded. Can you talk to me about the guidelines that you've come up with here? So, so the guidelines were, um, it was, were the outcome of a year-long um, process where we, first we went to 40 different buildings and we followed waste from where someone throws it away mm -hmm. to where it gets collected on the curb. And we talked to so many supers and porters and residents and commercial tenants to see what was happening to the waste. Mm -hmm. And then we'd bring that information into a workshop and we'd have these workshops focusing on either residential commercial waste or collection. And in those workshops, we'd have someone who actually is dealing with the waste, a porter. Then we'd have right. like a, someone who works for a big developer who mm -hmm. manages multi-million dollar projects and has to design the building. Um, and then we'd have people from the Department of Sanitation, City Planning, Department of Transit, because it all comes together. I mean, what happens on our streets is, a part, is part of so many different agencies. I've never heard of anything like that in terms of having those many different kinds of people in very different it was, sectors. It's really great. In a room. Yeah. And then we'd break out into groups and we'd focus on one thing, like right. existing residential buildings where they have a shoot for trash and everybody has to bring the recycling or down to the basement. How are you going to make it so people don't just throw everything all in the trash? How could you make it to have what one of the strategies is called equal convenience disposal? So mm -hmm. everything you can dispose of in the same place. So we'd look at how could that be done in an existing building? What should be done yeah. in a new building? Should we change the building code, which requires a shoot and all these things? How much labor do you have? Right. Everybody has to get like Etsy. Yeah. Everybody, like, in my mind, like, that's what we all need to be doing. It's just being more like Etsy. Can you talk to me a little bit about the personal responsibility aspect here? Because it seems like in order for this to be implemented, these guidelines, in order for, you know, these really amazing rooms and conversations to actually end up, like, making change, there has to be a bit of a shift in consciousness. We can't even, like, at this point, charge people for plastic bags without yeah. it being, like, an uproar. So... I mean, how do Although we work on that? Most, most people support that. You think <laughs> so? Bank yeah. charge, I think. Um, in the city, if you ask people like that. I absolutely do. Um, I think, I mean, that was a really interesting thing because it feels to me the conversation about waste so far has been mm -hmm. a lot about personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it's really tough for some people that buildings are not set up right. It's, it's the hard thing to do to bring your own bag, to say, no, no, no bag. Right. Um, or to try and get a sandwich not in plastic. It's right. the difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. So the thing about design is making it the easy thing to mm -hmm. do. And if it's designed, if you work in a place, yes, like Etsy, it's designed there and it's not so difficult to do. So it doesn't have to be such a moral thing. It, right. it just should be the easiest thing to do. And it should be pleasant. That's yeah. my other idea, that garbage is disgusting because it's all mixed together. Mm -hmm. But if you have compost and recycling and a little bit of trash, which would be like plastic films and stuff that can't be recycled, mm -hmm. that's not disgusting anymore. No. Well, thank you so much for being <laughs> here. I really appreciate it. This has been really enlightening for me. And I hope to have you back soon. Thank you. Hey, 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 hey. As we honor Black History Month, we look back 200 years to when slavery was the law of the land and still largely unchallenged, and to the birth of a child who would go on to challenge the peculiar institution as no other ex slave would. Frederick Douglass was born in 1818, and many years later, after escaping to freedom, said this, Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. On February 26th, Douglass's great-great-grandson, Lloyd Weaver, a journalist and filmmaker, will speak about his legendary ancestor's legacy at the Center for Black Literature at Medgar Evers College. He joins us now. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Along with Dr. Brenda Green, the center's executive director, thank you also for coming on 112. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us. So just to start for a second here, Mr. Weaver, of course you never met your great-great-grandfather <laughs> as he died in 1895. Well, you mentioned that. Yes. <laughs> I know some people probably, yeah. you know, like, oh, what was he like? And you're like, no. Nah. 
Yeah, right. But how did you get to know him through the stories in your family? That's an interesting way to, uh, to ask the question about my relationship with, with a great ancestor that, mm -hmm. uh, because of people's response to the fact that I'm in a bloodline, you know, mm -hmm. I, there, there are so many possible um, expectations of who and what. Um, having an ancestor such as Frederick Douglass, of course, the conversation is just about um, constant. I got to know him because uh, I was born in Washington, D.C., and I'm 76 years old, and when I was a little kid, he had left an estate, Highland Beach, which was sort of like the Martha's Vineyard of, <laughs> of the time for black people. And I remember being there and swimming and enjoying that, and that's who Frederick Douglass was to me, the guy that left, left <laughs> us a beach. Um, but as time went on and I became more and more conscious about the situation of African Americans in this country, um, his legacy was shoved in my face, you, you might say, because, you know, what are you going to do when you mm -hmm. grow up? And there were these expectations. Um, that I would be involved in some kind of position insofar as our continuing struggle is concerned. So there was that expectation, and every once in a while I'd be asked as a little kid to stand in front of the church and recite the fourth, the well-known Fourth of July speech and things like that. And so I kind of got a, a what is this kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. um, I, my name is Lloyd Weaver, not Frederick Douglass, and uh, I don't know if I want to live up to all of that. Uh, ultimately, though, I, I think it was of my own volition, though it may have been a response to his spirit being around me, I did become very, very active um, in our continuing struggle, you know, um, from the time I, I went to school on, you know, went wow. to university on. Wow. And that just, it really, really makes me wonder about these connections, you know, what we, what's put upon us by our names, our last names, or our history, mm -hmm. and also, like, what we sort of run from in our past, or, you know, we don't want to be, or we want to be our own person. Well, I, I guess I run from having to answer that question. Yes. <laughs> so but insofar right. as our obligation to a legacy is concerned, I, I feel very strongly about that. Mm -hmm. And whether it was a legacy or not, I feel very, very much obligated to uh, rectifying, you know, uh, the continuing legacy of, of, of slavery and Absolutely. of that um, part of human history uh, that we've gone through. So there is, a res there is a responsibility for all of us and a responsibility on all of our parts to learn the techniques and the ways of of resistance and of mm -hmm. our continuing struggle. Absolutely. And of course, in Frederick Douglass' life, there's example of an example of an example, and that's a whole study there. Mm -hmm. If he had lived the however many years since his passing away in 1895, mm -hmm. what have what have he would he have grown into? What have what you know would have been his understanding of human nature? that leads to us treating the way that we ultimately seem to do, you know, with such cruelty. And what would we know and what would we have in common in terms of responses to his leadership? Mm -hmm. um, so these are things we constantly wonder about. Those are more interesting questions, I think. Those mm -hmm. are the real mm -hmm. interesting questions that you're asking there. And Dr. Green, this is a month of stories about black history. Yes. Can you talk to me a little bit about your role in furthering those stories? Well, the Center for Black Literature, which was founded in 2003, has as its mission to expand the public's knowledge mm -hmm. about the literature produced by black writers to come, become a, a space where issues and challenges facing writers and artists can be discussed, to look at how writers use um, texts to tell their stories and to raise awareness. You know, our writers and our artists and our musicians and our performers, they really are the conscience of the nation. And so having uh, Lloyd Weaver come in Black History Month is really a continuation of how we raise awareness and make sure that we understand the story. That story is more important mm -hmm. now than ever. And it's really, it's part of what we, try to do through our conference, um, 
the National Black Writers Conference, which is held every other year at Medgar Evers College, is to create a platform where those issues can be discussed in a in a forum that's o on a series over a series of days. Mm -hmm. And so this program um, at Black History Month becomes part of a pre-conference activity, or what we're calling it is, it's part of a strand of our conference, Community Conversations on Race, Resistance, and Activism. It's one of those conversations that we have to have. And it's not just talking to each other, it's for everyone. We, we have to have this in our nation when we look at the, I was going to say regime, when we look at what we're living under mm -hmm. today. Yes. Tell me about the event coming up and how people can attend. Okay, the the uh, bicentennial celebration mm -hmm. is going to be on Monday evening, um, February 26th, at Megar Evers College. Mm -hmm. You can visit the center website, www.centerforblackliterature.org. And Mr. Weaver, how will you be contributing? Well, I'll be there talking about what <laughs> I usually talk about, which is art and how artists must be more co committed committed to the point where we actually study techniques of propagandizing for whatever we think people should do as a result of observing our art. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever space they <laughs> give me, I'll, I'll, I'll have something to talk about, and it'll be along that line. Can I add um, to this? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I did left off someone very important, a featured um, journalist and scholar, and um, someone who's done a lot of history on Frederick Douglass is Herb Boyd. Mm. who will be um, opening the program for us and, and giving a talk on Frederick uh, Douglass. And then we will, uh, Mr. Weaver and I will be in conversation about really trying to unpack what we know to dig more deeply into what, um, who Frederick Douglass was, how he became, um, what was his journey. For the broadcast audience, we have to cut things off here. But the conversation will continue on the podcast, which you can find by searching 112BK on Apple iTunes or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Theater director, actor, jazz vocalist, leading light of New York's New Yorican Poets Cafe, and the father of an Olympic swimmer. And that's only one guest. Here to talk about his official role as artist, artistic theater director of the renowned New Yorican Poets Cafe to preview his upcoming concert this Sunday and to sing us a song is Rome Neal. Welcome to 112VK. <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure being here. It truly is, yes. I'm so glad you're here. So you've got an eclectic background, lots of talents. Oh, you wow. seem like a little bit of a renaissance man. When did jazz become your thing? You know, I did a one-man play about Thelonious Monk mm -hmm. by Lawrence Holder entitled Monk. And this was about 17 years ago. And when I did that play, you know, I had to do research and, and find out who this man was because I didn't know that much about Monk. Mm -hmm. So I went to all the jazz clubs in Harlem and I did the research and I loved it. It turned me out. Yeah. I loved it so much <laughs> that I needed to bring that energy back to my home base, which is the New York and Poets Cafe. Yes. And I did. And I, when I did, I started a series called Banana Pudding Jazz, yes. which I gave you a cup of banana pudding. Yes, you did. And it's so good. <laughs> I'm so happy about it. So I just started this jazz series. And during the process, I started singing jazz also and uh, just loved what a song can do and what a song meant to me and to my audiences. So I became this jazz vocalist also. And you've got a concert coming up. Yes, yes. Tell me about that. I'll be at the Emmanuel Baptist Church Jazz Vespers. Mm -hmm. That's this Sunday at 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be an amazing concert because this is my first time doing the Jazz Vespers at this wonderful church that, start, that was built back in the 1800s. Wow. And this, I think this will be, be my mm -hmm. biggest audience because they hold about 700 people there. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it, the Jazz Vespers program is about six years old, and uh, it's just an honor to be a part of this, especially during Black History Month. I know you were saying earlier that it's going to be at the Emanuel Baptist Church. I just want to quickly get the address for that. Okay, Emanuel Baptist Church is 279 Lafayette Avenue. That's between 
St. James and uh, on Lafayette, yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Tell me about banana pudding jazz because I <laughs> I have to tell you, like upon hearing it at first, it's like, what? What does that mean? But it's your brand, like it's your personal brand of jazz, right? Yes, yeah, personal because I make the banana pudding for everybody, every, I've been doing it for the past 17 years, oh now, uh, no, 15 years now, going on 15 years making the banana pudding for, mm -hmm. for my audiences and it's complimentary to them. And I have featured jazz artists which come on to perform. And after the, the performance of the feature, then there's an open mic segment. Wow. And we feature other artists, vocalists and musicians. And I've been able to uh, feature legendary artists like uh, the great Barry Harris has been there. Randy Weston has been there, a Brooklyn artist within his own right. Uh, T.S. Monk, Thelonious Monk's son. All the greats have performed there, and uh, it's just uh, been a, a, a whirlwind of fun for me to bring to light jazz at the New York and Poets Cafe and serve up that banana pudding, which oh, they yeah. so love. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. And I just, you know, and it's, you know, speaking of, you know, first of all, banana pudding, but also jazz and all stuff, it's Black History Month. Yes. And so much of our culture is really, you know, at the forefront this month. Mm -hmm. It should be more often, but, you know, we get this time and we should take it and take full advantage of it. Speaking of black history. Yes. Your daughter just made some history. Correct? Yes, she made history. She's a two-time Olympic swimmer, mm -hmm. and uh, we're very proud of her, Leah Neal. Yes. Uh, she was one of the, you know, it says she was the second black swimmer to swim in the Olympics. Wow. Female swimmer to swim in the, the Olympics, and that was back in 2012 in London. And then she went on to do Rio uh, in 2016 to make it her second time swimming in the Olympics. And uh, that's our Brooklyn baby, and we're all so very proud of her. Now, you're going to sing us a song. Yes. What's the song? You know, I thought about what song from my repertoire that I would do, and then, then what came to mind was we're celebrating black history, so it would have to be a song by one of our uh, African-American writers. Mm -hmm. And the one came to mind was uh, Billy Eckstein who wrote a wonderful tune called I Want to Talk About You. I'm so excited. I'm yeah. so excited. Okay. While Mr. Rome is getting ready to sing for us, here's what's happening tomorrow. New York City Council member Richie Torres will be joining us. We'll meet one of Brooklyn's 30 Under 30 here to talk food justice. And from the Billy Holiday Theater, a play about strange fruit. See you then. Don't tell me about a night in June or a shady lane beneath a velvet moon. Don't tell me, cause I wanna talk about you. Don't mention that old waterfall or a grassy spot where crickets softly call, don't tell me.